could ask members who are leaving the chamber to please do so as quickly and as quietly as possible, since Parliament is still in session. The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 13261 in the name of Rhoda Grant on Carers Week 2015. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I'd be grateful if those members who would like to participate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. I call on Rhoda Grant to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a privilege to secure this Members' Debate on Carers' Week. Carers' Week is one of the most important weeks we celebrate in the year. For too long, the work of Scotland's unpaid carers has gone unrecognised and unsupported, and this week gives us the opportunity to highlight and pay tribute to our carers and the tremendous job they do. Caring is something that most of us will have to do. It's estimated that three in five people will have a caring responsibility at some point in their lifetime. There are over 759,000 unpaid adult carers and over 29,000 young carers in Scotland, and they save the Scottish economy over £10 billion a year. In my region, Highlands and Islands, there's an estimated 40,518 carers, Carers can often feel isolated, especially when they're a distance from services. Many carers have had multiple episodes of caring and are often caring for more than one person at a time. For example, caring for a child with disabilities and an elderly parent. This is done with love, but the stress it causes can sometimes be unbearable, and that's why we need to support our carers. I welcome the Carers' Bill, a bill that will hopefully improve the lot of carers and give them entitlements in their own right. I think we all acknowledge that this is a step in the right direction, but we also recognise that we will need to take many more steps before we get it right. Carers are concerned that if the criteria for assistance is set locally, then they will miss out because of limited local government resources. Councils are likewise concerned that if the criteria is set nationally without being funded, then other services will suffer. Carers must have support services, and if not, they may be unable to continue caring. We will attempt to amend the bill in a number of ways, and far too many um, to go into here tonight to improve the lot of carers. One example would be to give the Care Inspectorate responsibility for inspecting the standards and provision of care services across Scotland. And this will mean that supporting groups, uh, information and advice centres for carers all need to um, meet national standards. Regardless of who sets the criteria, services will be subject to inspection to ensure that the promises made in the bill will become a reality. The theme of Carers Week is carer-friendly communities. A carer-friendly community is one where all aspects of the community are geared to meet the needs of carers, from health services to the workplace, from primary schools to university. Employers can sign up to, to being carer positive. Schools can allow young carers flexibility and support, for example, removing the need for homework while providing additional support at school. Colleges and universities can employ similar policies to enhance learning while supporting young carers in their role. We in the Labour Party support the Scottish Youth Parliament Care Fair Share campaign that highlights the need for young people, needs of young people in education. They call for changes um, to EMA guidance, so carers are guaranteed not to lose their EMA due to attendance issues. Extending SAS dependency grants so that carers get an extra £2,640 a year when in higher education and extending Young Scots concessionary travel to young adults until they're 25, all of those who are caring. National carers organisations in their briefings for this debate also remind us that as MSPs, we are uniquely placed to help carers. They ask us to scrutinise and amend legislation to make it carer friendly, not just the carers bill that's in front of us at the moment, but all other legislation that impacts on them and their loved ones. Carers' information services, where they're available, are a godsend, and carers' groups welcome the duty to provide advice and information in the carers' bill. However, they're concerned that good practice that is available in some areas will be replaced rather than replicated all over. Carers are often financially disadvantaged. Many have to give up work, costing both themselves and the economy, and that's why having carer-friendly employers is so important. 
because work's not just important to the personal, person's financial security, it's also often the only respite they get from their caring responsibilities. Carers need to be able to decide how much time they commit to caring so that they can also have a life of their own, working and socialising. Where this doesn't happen, we see carers break under the strain, meaning that the state ends up caring for two people instead of one. Carers, for the most part, want to care. They don't see themselves as carers first. They are mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, sisters, brothers, and often much more distantly related than that. And in many cases, is their friends, and they also want to care and protect. And we need to help them do that. The Marie Curie briefing for tonight's debate tells us about the needs of carers in a palliative care situation. This can be short term when someone suddenly becomes terminally ill. It can put pressure on work commitments and financial responsibilities. Gaining a power of attorney can often take many months leading to bills going unpaid and this leads to untold pressures on the carer. Carers may also have no knowledge at all about the condition of the person they're looking after and how best to look after that person in a terminal illness. They must have support and guidance to help them do this. There are also many carers whose loved ones have life-shortening conditions who they have cared for for many years. And as the condition progresses, their caring becomes more intense and the need, needs of the cared for person change. And it's important that services adapt their support to meet the needs of both the carer and their loved one. For these carers, bereavement support is extremely important. In many cases, they have forfeited many aspects of what we would call normal life to dedicate theirs to caring. Therefore, in bereavement, they not only lose a loved one, but they often also lose the reason for being. The period of time given to them to adapt is not long enough for a normal grieving process, far less for someone who has put their life on hold for care, to care. And we need to be more compassionate and supporting of them. Presiding officer, I want to close by paying tribute to the work of unpaid carers. To people like Claire Lally, our carers champion, who is a carer herself, but has dedicated, is absolutely dedicated to promoting carers' rights. And believe me, is a force to be reckoned with. If we all resolve to be carer-friendly and create carer-friendly communities, we can make a real difference to their lives. Thank you very much. I now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Joan McAlpine to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'd like to congratulate Rhoda Grant on securing this timely debate on carers, which I'm delighted to speak in uh, as co-convener of the cross-party group on carers, although, of course, in this, uh, in this speech I will be uh, speaking for myself. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging this government's important work on behalf of Scotland's 7,500 uh, 759,000 carers. The investment in carers since 2007 has now reached 114 million and includes 14 million for voluntary sector short breaks uh, plus an extra 10,000 extra weeks respite which was delivered by the concordat between government and local authorities. Um, there's also 28.9 million to health boards for direct support including the establishment of carer services and carer centres offering advocacy. Uh, the Scottish Government also funds the Young Carers Festival each year and every MSP who's attended the festival knows it's a transformative experience for those who take part. In 2011, the SNP manifesto promised a carers parliament to ensure that this group had a powerful direct voice and there have now been three such parliaments and it's the work of these parliaments that's resulted in the present carers bill and I think that reflects very well on how democracy works in Scotland. Constitutional change also affects carers. The Smith Commission, for example, promised that the Scottish Parliament would, I quote, have complete autonomy in determining the structure and value of certain benefits. And these included carers' allowances. However, in its current form, the Scotland Bill going through Westminster defines carers as over 16 and not in full-time education or employment. That is completely unacceptable, and uh, I'm sure many carers' organisations, particularly the organisations representing young carers, find that unacceptable. 
The SNP has said that we could use the new powers to raise carers' allowance to the level of job seekers' allowance. But as the Cabinet Secretary for Welfare, Alec Neil, told the Welfare Committee this week, any additional money that we give to carers will be treated as income under the Department of Work and Pension system for universal credit. And that, of course, could be clawed back. Presiding officer, that is unfair to carers, disrespectful to this parliament and contradictory to both the letter and the spirit of the Smith Commission. Finally, I would also like to turn to the carers bill, which has, of course, been warmly welcomed by the sector. Um, it enshrines for the first time carers' rights in law. Uh, I've read written submissions to the Health Committee on the bill, and I'd like to highlight two of them. Marie Curie suggests that specific measures are required for carers supporting the terminally ill. As Rhoda Grant has already alluded to, I'd like to um, particularly point out um, one issue that they raise in that these carers may only wish to take respite for a few hours rather than a few days. And that strikes me as a very constructive suggestion, which is easily achievable. I'd also like to highlight the uh, submission from Enable. Uh, they raise the issue of emergency planning and future planning for lifelong carers. Uh, these are often elderly parents of a disabled adult child, um, and they have considerable uh, worry and concern about their child's future uh, should an emergency arise, or, or even in the short term, uh, if they need to go into hospital and carers, and particularly elderly carers, often have additional health needs. Um, and while some local authorities plan well for this, others do not. The previous minister with responsibility for carers, Michael Matheson, funded a piece of work on this topic carried out by Enable called Picking Up the Pieces, which recommended that emergency planning for carers should be considered with all, within all health and social care policies. However, emergency and future planning does not appear on the face of the bill as it stands. Uh, Enable are strongly of the view that it should, and they believe that provision should be made for emergency planning in the Adult Carer Support Plan and the Young Carer Statement, which is established by the bill. The bill also introduces a duty to provide information and advice, and again, Enable argue that this should include provision of information and advice in regards to emergency and future planning. In conclusion, presiding officer, I'm delighted uh, by the government's track record on support for carers, but concerned that this progress could be undermined by UK government welfare reform. I also warmly welcome the carers bill currently before this parliament and would like to see it further improved with the introduction of the different and distinct measures advocated by both Marie Curie and Enable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now call Joanne Lamont to be followed by Nanette Mill. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also congratulate Rhoda Grant on securing this debate and recognise the importance of the opportunity provided by Carers Week to recognise the work and the challenges faced by those who care. It is an opportunity, I think, to celebrate what people out of love do for those that they care for, but also to celebrate amazing people like Claire Lally, um, but others from across the parties who have spoken out and spoken up in the interests of carers, have demanded that we listen and have ensured that not just their care needs are met, but the needs of those they care for as well. And this is not something that is um, an issue for indi any individual particular party. I'm very proud of the work that was done since the beginning of this parliament, particularly, for example, establishing carer centres. I'm particularly proud of the South West Carer Centre in Glasgow, which does amazing work, not just in terms of advocacy, but offering support, a place to come where you can get support from those who are also under pressure, but developing ideas about how we can better support carers and those that they, they care for. And it is a mark of this parliament that from the very earliest days, carers insisted that their voices be heard. And in those days where the parliament was opening itself up, where people had already a clear idea about what needed to be done, that did create progress and opportunities. And I hope that we can continue with that on a cross-party um, basis too, because it is important that we listen to the direct experience of people rather than allow ourselves to be drawn, as we too often are, into a competition about how much we care. Because I think there is a challenge for us all in that we should not allow ourselves to patronise carers with warm words and nothing more. For some, the reality is, and I um, wrote a piece about how people driven by love cared for their loved ones and was chastised by one woman who contacted me who said that, in fact, hers was not a choice. 
that she was caring because she had to and she felt guilty because she was trapped. And her uh, situation is as much valid as any other and we should not simply romanticise this, although we know how much it is driven by care. We recognise there are people too who are trapped in circumstances where they do need the support in order to do uh, what they feel they need to do and not feel guilty about it being a burden on them. But we do know overwhelmingly that carers do what they do because they want to. And it's our challenge as a society to support them in doing that. And we should not take advantage of that sense of responsibility, that somehow support to a family can be reduced because they will never walk away. A system of a kind of a brinkmanship which relies on people's um, love for their cared for one that they will accept um, even diminished care and support. And we need to know that that process is happening in our communities and we must do all we can to make sure that doesn't happen. And equally, it is important to understand that even where there is support, even where there is respite, if people don't have confidence in leaving their loved one there, in the care of someone else, they will not take that support. That is why it is important to properly value paid carers, because those who are unpaid carers will not trust them unless they see that the quality is there. They will not take time off for the rest of their family if they're not confident the respite has been offered is safe and secure. And it is important, therefore, that we put this in the context of the broader debate about what care actually should be like. It is about high quality uh, respite provision. It is about flexibility. The little bits of caring that makes a difference, getting to go to church or getting to go to the library, time out to go and shop, time for families with a disabled child to spend time and focusing on the other children in the family. And these little bits of flexibility need to be built into the system too, in order for carers to be able to do their jobs. In relation to young carers, we must recognise there are some young people caring and it is inappropriate care because the system is not supporting people with addictions, drug and alcohol problems, and children are being left to care in those circumstances. We need to redouble our efforts to make sure that that support is being put in place. We need to recognise the consequence for educational attainment. And therefore, it is important there's provision in schools, homeschooling, the kinds of supports that allow a child to come into school and which are reducing in our schools as we speak. We need to look at how we make sure those provisions are there. And ultimately, I think my plea is this. We can prove that we have all in the time that we've had power done great things for carers. But we need to look now at what's happening with budgets and the consequence of those for people in our communities. There is a silent suffering and there is an intolerable burden being brought to bear on carers. And we should all be open to that. All of us can prove it's somebody else's responsibility. All of us condemn the cuts at UK level, condemn the welfare choices that are being made, but we also have a more serious responsibility in this Parliament to look at what we are spending our money on. Are we denying cash to local government and, as a consequence, a diminution of the services that people there require? And I think across the Chamber, we respect and admire those who care across the chamber, I think we too should take joint responsibility looking at what we can do to make sure that they are not continuing to do the job that we want them to do in a way that is unsupported. And I think that can be a mark of celebration in Carers Week if we again unite in making sure we talk about what we can do to make a difference rather than the things that perhaps that divide us on other issues. Thank you. I call Nanette Millen to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I add my thanks to Rhoda Grant for lodging the motion before us this evening. It's also a very timely debate given the fact that the Carers' Bill is going through Parliament at the present time and will shortly complete its Stage 1 process. For nearly 50 years, Carers UK has been at the forefront of campaigns to secure a fair and equitable deal for carers who contribute so much to society. Through successful lobbying, we have seen in 1967 the introduction of the Dependent Relative Tax Allowance, the first time legal rights for carers um, were established in law. This was followed in 1976 by introducing Invalid Care Allowance, and throughout the last 30 years, changes have been made to recognise the needs of carers in their own right, pension rights for carers, and in 2013, a safeguard to protect carers' allowances when other benefits faced cuts in tough economic times. I was interested to learn the genesis of what may be termed the carers' movement was a lady called Mary Webster, who in 1954 gave up her job as a congregational minister to care for her parents. 
Over the next decade, she made the public aware of the isolation and financial hardship often faced by carers, successfully leading to legislative changes, giving that much needed financial support. Despite dying tragically young in 1969 at only 46 years of age, her legacy as a champion for carers' rights continues. In that respect, we've seen the recent establishment of Carers Champions, for instance in Edinburgh and in Glasgow, acting as an independent voice, listening to carers and working closely with social services. In my home city of Aberdeen, support, advice and information for carers is provided by Voluntary Service Aberdeen. So there does seem to be a growing culture of recognition that those who care for a loved one do need the necessary help in juggling many responsibilities, such as continuing in employment. But there are still many carers who go unrecognised, and it's important that these people are identified and made aware of the support they're entitled to. A particular group of carers who do a fantastic job for their families without statutory support are informal kinship carers, many of whom rescue their grandchildren as babies from chaotic home circumstances and are then, are, are then left literally holding the baby, without the support given to carers of children identified as looked after. I'm pleased that efforts are now underway to help this group of carers. And many young people have family caring responsibilities which can take away their childhood if they're not given proper support. And it's important that they are recognised as young carers and given the understanding they deserve and are helped to lead as normal a young life as possible. This year, Carers Week, which is made possible by Carers Scotland and Carers Trust Scotland, involves other charities as noted in the motion. One such charity which plays a huge part in making Carers Week a success is Marie Curie, whose focus primarily is on people who look after loved ones with terminal illnesses. And Marie Curie makes a very good point that these individuals often do not realise or recognise that they are carers. Rather, they would see themselves as people looking after someone they love at the end of life. The vast majority of people would prefer to die at home or in a homely setting, yet over 50% die in a hospital. Research has found that having a carer was the single most important factor making it possible for a person to die at home, whereas living alone or being unmarried increased the likelihood of a person dying in hospital. Caring for someone at the end of life can be both physically and emotionally demanding and is often accompanied by a carer struggling to come to terms with the loss of a loved one. The health of these carers can often be affected and they may have very specific needs and requirements which need to be considered in the care and support made available to them. Therefore, Marie Curie has launched the Marie Curie Helper Service, the Marie Curie Support Line, and Bereavement Support Services to help people access practical, emotional and financial resources and to get the right information and support at the right time. Marie Curie, in its briefing notes, makes a few points regarding the Carers Bill which would seek to make amendments to the Bill and I'll examine these in discussions with colleagues when we reach stage two of the parliamentary process. Finally, presiding officer, as has been mentioned, there'll be thousands of events taking place across the country as part of Carers Week. And I wish all involved every success in their efforts to raise awareness of the vital contribution which carers make in communities right across Scotland. And we must remember that these events can actually be great fun. So once again, my thanks to Rhoda Grant for securing the debate. Thank you very much. I now call Mark MacDonald to be followed by Claudia Bumish. Th thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I congratulate Rhoda Grant on, on securing this debate? I myself had tabled a, a motion on Carers Week as well, although I didn't mark mine for members' business. So I congratulate her on securing the debate in, in Carers Week. I, I'd thought about what I was going to say this evening, Presiding Officer, because I think Joanne Lamont makes a very good point, is that often uh, we speak in debates in this chamber and, and those outside watching in often see what they consider to be warm words and platitudes. And so I thought what I would do instead was to um, talk a little bit about what, it's, what, what actually happens and what actually is involved. Because I uh, am a carer, probably the secondary carer for my son. Uh, my wife would be, would be considered his primary carer. And it occurred to me reading some of the, the comments on social media um, the impact that caring has on other people and how much of it I recognise myself. The realisation, for example, that there is a strong likelihood that my son will require care and support from us for the rest of his life. There is a, a strong requirement that that will be the case and many other people are in that situation of having a child who they know is going to be dependent upon their care and also the care uh, of, of the state for, for their whole life and that they won't experience some of the things that many 
parents will experience in relation to their children. Obviously, there is hope that there, there, there will be other experiences, but many of the things that, that people would take for granted as being a parental experience uh, aren't always experienced. And there are other things that arise, and, and one of the things that is often said is that um, it's different for uh, myself as a carer because I'm an MSP, I have a comfortable uh, income. And, and that certainly helps in a number of areas and helps for others who are in that position. Indeed, when, um, when, when my mother was caring for my grandparents, she was fortunate that my father was earning an income and therefore was able to uh, in, ensure that the, there was financial support uh, available. And many people are in those situations. Many people are not, however. But income uh, will only provide in some areas um, the fact that, you know, uh, our life is one of uh, constantly broken sleep, for example. Indeed, until my son was prescribed with melatonin, one of us would have to be in his room until around about midnight, one in the morning, before he went to sleep, because uh, if we didn't, he would be through waking up his uh, then baby uh, and, and toddler sister, um, uh, and that would cre create broken sleep for her. Uh, and uh, obviously, um, he would then be up again at four or five in the morning. So three to four hour sleeps were uh, becoming a regular occurrence. And that's the same for many people. Many people have to get up through the night in order to administer medication to loved ones. Um, many people uh, often have to sleep in the same room as loved ones, um, creating uh, difficult conditions for themselves. And that's why I think when we look at the legislation that is being put in place, and I welcome the, the, the legislation that's being brought forward, I think we also have to look beyond the, the provision of a carer's uh, statement and the carer's support plan. Because where support is identified as being necessary, but is not already available locally, um, what provisions can we put in place to ensure that that is, is part of the thinking of local authorities and health boards? And sleep counselling, I think, is one of those examples. It's not always available at a local level, but in many instances, uh, it can be uh, absolutely vital in ensuring that where uh, there are impacts on the sleep patterns of parents and of siblings, sleep counselling can be a really important assistance. But if there are not trained sleep counsellors available at a local level, having it listed as being something that would be required to support an individual uh, is fine on paper. How do we put it into practice? And that's something I think that we all need to think about uh, when we move this forward, because it is fine for us to um, put the funding in place for support measures. It's fine for us to put in place the support plan for carers. What we then have to ensure is that when that support plan is in place, the things that are identified as being required by carers can be delivered because I think that's what carers expect from this legislation is that the support plan won't just be provided it will also be acted upon so I think I, I would draw my remarks to a close at that and I would say that simply say that while uh, I welcome the opportunity to have this debate in carers week we shouldn't forget that for Scotland's carers every week is carers week. Many thanks um, and finally in the open debate Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you presiding officer. I extend my thanks to Rhoda Grant as well for, for welcoming Carers Week into the Parliament in this debate. Every year I'm impressed by the effort put into promoting carers' rights and raising awareness of the fantastic work carers do. This year, the scope of events across Scotland is brilliant, as we've heard from other members. As an ex-young carer, I'm committed to standing up for carers, and along with Joan McAlpine, a, a convener of the cross-party group, the unexpected responsibility that comes for care, with caring for somebody can impact detrimentally on a person's health, education, employment, relationships, in fact, all aspects of life. Their contribution is huge, not just to the person whom they're looking after, but to the country, saving the NHS an estimated uh, £10.3 billion a year. As they care for others, we must care for them. The theme... Building carer-friendly communities is a fantastic one this year. A compassionate community with a clear understanding of the demands placed on unpaid carers could make the world of difference. The Scottish Youth Parliament figures show that only 45.5% of those in work felt able to tell their employer about their young adult carer status, and 55.4% have less time with friends and so can feel very isolated. A carer-friendly community would help carers feel comfortable in identifying themselves as carers. We should all use this week to raise awareness among employers, GPs, 
local services and systems to ensure that they can be accommodating and alleviate some of the daily pressures that carers face. In my region of South Scotland alone, this week is filled with fundraisers like bag packing with the Dumfries and Galloway Carers Centre and activities and workshops with borders with Scottish Borders Voluntary Care Voice or having a cup of tea with Support in Mind Scotland at their pop-up cafe. Of course, these organisations operate all year round. I recently visited Lanarkshire Carers Network's new facilities to meet their board and some young carers. And I believe that the minister went to, to that in Hamilton recently as well. It has been the forward thinking of this and other networks that has contributed to driving some of the national policy forward while also offering a range of support services, of course, for carers. The Borders Voluntary Care Voice holds an annual forum, and I'm pleased to have attended ever since I've become an MSP, which is an excellent place for carers in rural and remote areas to inform MSPs of their issues. And one of the issues that came up, actually, is what Mark MacDonald raised in his um, contribution about sleep counselling. And often in rural areas, it's very difficult to find the right um, support for carers. Carers have, though, been effective in driving forward change for better recognition and support alongside other organisations. And a great example of the successes is the Scottish Youth Parliament's Care Fair Share uh, campaign last year. And thanks to the hard work of youth members, young and young adult carers in education have more flexible options for funding assistance because I understand though perhaps a minister will correct me if I'm wrong on this, that the Educational Maintenance Allowance now recognises young carers as vulnerable and therefore entitled to a more flexible learning agreement. And furthermore, that the Student Awards Agency for Scotland now includes carers in eligibility for dependents and lone parents grants. Before I um, make some re brief remarks on the um, Carers' Bill, I would like to also identify myself with the wise analysis of my friend and colleague Joanne um, Lamont, on the, uh, on, as, as she was an ex-convener of the CPG for carers um, and the comments she made in this debate. This is indeed a seismic time for Scotland's unpaid carers and the Carers' Bill promises to make a significant difference but there are a number of issues which carers and their representative organisations have highlighted and last week I was delighted to welcome the Minister to the CPG for carers to share some of these concerns. What seems like a minor change can be vital to someone responsible for a, a loved one's care. To be consulted in the planning of discharge from hospital would minimise surprise and confusion. A specific duty to enable carers to take short breaks, has been shown, which have been shown to make such a huge difference to mental well-being, is also vital. And support in the creation of the emergency future plan, which has already been mentioned in this debate, would defuse the what-ifs, that, uh, that can keep a carer awake at night. Furthermore, carers are calling for consideration of a national eligibility criteria to stop the postcode lottery of basic supports. I very much hope the Minister will listen to these points and consider the Scottish, some Scottish Government amendments to the Carers' Bill, which I'm sure organisations and members of the cross-party group would be happy to work on with the Scottish Government if this is appropriate. And I again thank Rhoda Grant for bringing this members' debate to the Chamber as part of Carers' Week. Thank you. Many thanks. Can I now invite the Minister to respond to the debate? Uh, Minister, you have seven minutes or so. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I also join with us in thanking Rhoda Grant for initiating this uh, debate today, welcoming Carers Week and the contribution of carers to society. All members who have spoken have done so with genuine uh, respect for Scotland's carers and young carers. I hope members will forgive me for highlighting one uh, contribution, in particular that of my friend uh, Mark MacDonald, who's personal testimony is uh, talking about his own uh, continuing experience. I thought greatly enriched uh, this debate, so I want to thank him and indeed all members, but thank Mark for his particular contribution uh, today. Uh, Carers Week is a, an important juncture. It's a reminder of our need to focus on the outstanding work carers do. I was very happy to take part in an event earlier this year with Carers Scotland to publicise Carers Week. It was atop uh, Calton Hill, which may seem a strange place to do it in at uh, first glance, uh, President Officer, but of course Carers UK celebrates its 50th anniversary uh, this year and the Chief Executive, uh, Helena Herklotz, is uh, this year climbing 50 hills at uh, one for each year of the organisation's existence. I did point out to her uh, that day that Edinburgh has seven hills like Rome and she could get a few uh, done in one day, but I don't think she took me up 
on the suggestion. It is uh, right that we uh, recognise that carers and young carers are uh, integral to our uh, society, they provide vital care and support to uh, their families, friends and neighbours, often in very challenging uh, circumstances. That's the very reason we have introduced the uh, Carers' Bill to uh, Parliament. I know that's been the focus of much of the debate. I can speak a little bit more about that just now. Uh, we have introduced this bill because we want to accelerate the pace of change, building on what has already been achieved. Implementation of the bill will help ensure that carers are given the opportunity to balance their care and responsibilities with their uh, life goals, resulting in better health and well-being, and to have a life alongside uh, care. And I thought Joanne Lamont in particular spoke very uh, eloquently about the necessity, the human necessity for uh, uh, trying to achieve uh, that aim. And through the bill, we will introduce the adult care support plan that will be available to all adult carers, which will focus on the achievement of each carer's personal outcomes. The young care statement will do likewise for young carers and will take account of the fact that young carers have uh, very specific and different needs from uh, adult carers. Those adult carers and young carers who are identified as having needs will then be able to access uh, support through the information advice services that local authorities will be under a duty to provide and access uh, general services in the community. And if any remaining needs are eligible for bespoke support, Services like short breaks, advocacy training would be offered to carers who needs meet uh, the identified uh, criteria. The bill includes specific uh, provisions to ensure that local authorities must include carers and young carers in discussions about support for themselves and services for the people uh, they care for. Their expertise is invaluable in making sure that adequate and appropriate services are put in place. Uh, Rhoda Grant suggested ways that she might uh, like to uh, see the bill amended. Nanette Milne spoke uh, of uh, the suggestions from uh, Mary uh, Curie. Claudia Beamish uh, rightly referred to the fact I came along to uh, the cross-party group uh, just last week, I think it was, and uh, we had a discussion about some of the uh, potential uh, changes people would like to see there. Joan McAlpin, who is the co-convener of the cross-party group, I thank both Joan McAlpin and Claudia Beamish for their work in uh, that regard. Joan McAlpin also uh, made a, a suggestion uh, about uh, emergency uh, planning. I recognise this is an issue of concern to carers and I am uh, sympathetic to the arguments put forward by Enable and the National Carers Organisations and Scottish Government officials are currently working with Enable to understand uh, the, their proposals in more detail, how they would work and of course we will consider them in due course. But I should point out we have already, I have already committed uh, to making provision for emergency planning and regulations but we will be very happy to hear what Enable uh, has uh, to say. We are not yet uh, past stage one but I look forward to uh, seeing what suggestions come forward and working uh, with uh, the various members of the Health and Sport Committee to take the bill forward. I did mean to uh, mention as well Claudia Beamish, when I uh, referred to Claudia Beamish, she asked about the educational maintenance. Uh, so let me mention that in passing. It is the case that uh, to make clear the particular challenge that young carers uh, face, uh, Michael Matheson in his then role as the uh, Minister for Public Health, uh, along with Angela Constance, wrote to all directors of education and college principals highlighting the need uh, for full consideration of flexibility for young carers, so we have already set that out. Uh, President, obviously this uh, government's vision is of a flourishing, optimistic and innovative uh, Scotland tackling inequalities and promoting equality of opportunity remain our major challenge. We want a Scotland where people have control of their lives and are empowered to make choices. Carers, whatever their circumstances, should enjoy the same opportunities in life uh, as people without caring responsibilities and should be able to achieve their full potential as citizens. And of course, I'll give way briefly to Jan. Joanne Lamont. I wonder if the Minister accepts an issue about carers who want to work and one of the difficulties is, for example, if they're caring for a child, if the supports are not in the school that are appropriate to the child's needs, very often the school fails and therefore as a consequence the parent is able to work. I wonder what discussions you've had with the Education Secretary on these matters, but what the, the level of support is now being offered to children with special needs in school. Jim um, let me commit to John Lamont to take that up with uh, uh, colleagues in uh, the education side. I'll, I'll do that and uh, I'll get back to her and uh, I'll let her know where uh, we get to with uh, that uh, contact. Uh, building uh, carer-friendly communities, uh, the theme of this year's Carer Week, Rhoda Grant uh, mentioned that, is very much in line with the Scottish Government's vision I spoke of a, a second ago. Scotland has a growing population of older people successfully living longer, but often doing so with a range of complex and multiple physical and mental health uh, care needs. There are more children with complex health needs or disabilities. We need to support Scotland's carers so that they, in turn, can support the many people uh, uh, who they care for 
uh, 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 across the country. And we have, of course, spent over £140 million uh, since 2007 in supporting carers. 47% of carers live in the most deprived areas, caring for 35 hours a week or more. This is almost double the level in the least deprived areas. Carers experiencing considerable disadvantage need to be supported uh, equally. However, our wider work to tackle health inequalities within the wider context of tackling economic disadvantage is paramount. And that brings me on to the concerns that Joe McAlpin raised about the impact of the UK Government's welfare uh, reform agenda. I call on the UK Government to devolve the powers needed to support Scotland's carers. The Smith Commission did state, as Joe McAlpin pointed out, that the Scottish Parliament should have complete autonomy in determining the structure and value of the benefits uh, of any or any new benefits or services that might uh, replace the benefits they set out at paragraph 49 of their report, and that included a carer's allowance. However, in its current form, the Scotland Bill appears to restrict how the Scottish Government can support carers by defining them as over 16 and not in full-time education or employment. In addition to this, the rollout of personal independence payments will impact carers currently receiving carer's allowance and disability living allowance, with some expected not to be eligible for any support at all under the new system. Of course, this Government has uh, called on the UK Government to delay the role of, uh, rollout of PIP, and this is a good example of why we have done that. President Officer, this uh, uh, agenda supporting carers will always be uh, important to me, it will always be important to uh, this government. So let me conclude uh, by thanking all those individuals and organisations involved in Carers Week, all those who uh, take uh, a great effort to care for the people across uh, the country. This week of activity is hugely valuable and highlighting to everyone in Scotland the invaluable role that carers and young carers play in supporting the people they care for. And I thank Rhoda Grant once again for uh, securing this debate this evening. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes Rhoda Grant's debate on Carers Week 2015, and I now close this meeting of Parliament.